Welcome to Economics 1723 Capital Markets. This is the online module for Lecture 22 and we're going to discuss the Black-Scholes Option Pricing Formula. I want to lead into that topic by talking about pseudo-probabilities or risk-neutral probabilities, which are a general way of solving for option prices, and then we'll see how that applies to the uh, famous Black-Scholes Option Pricing Formula. So pseudo-probabilities um, are most easily explained if we go back to a two-state example. Go all the way back to the beginning of the course in September and recall the relation between asset prices and Arrow de Brewer state prices or contingent claim prices that the price of any asset I is going to be the payoffs in the two states, um, state 1 and state 2, the payoff X1I in state 1 and X2I in state 2, and then we just multiply by the state prices for dollars to be received in state 1 and state 2. Q1 and Q2 are the state prices. So that can be used to price any asset in a two-state example, and we can rearrange this to obtain an analytically convenient way to value options. So um, just to remind you, uh, we can rewrite that formula by taking the state prices and multiplying and dividing by probabilities. Okay, uh, then we define the ratio of state price to probability as the stochastic discount factor M, and we have probability times stochastic discount factor times payoff for each state. That's the expected product of the stochastic discount factor and the payoff. So you may not want to see this again, but the stochastic discount factor is back. Now, actually, we're not going to use this exactly. We're going to do a, a, a different but related trick. So what we're going to do instead is take the basic equation, which had the Q1X1I and Q2X2I, and in, this time, instead of multiplying and dividing by probability, we're going to multiply and divide by the sum of the state prices, Q1 plus Q2. So we multiply here, we divide here, and divide here. Now, recall, look down here, that the price of a riskless payoff that's going to be $1 in each state is Q1 plus Q2. If you buy one of every lottery ticket, you get a sure payoff. That means that the gross riskless interest rate, 1 plus RF, is the reciprocal of Q1 plus Q2, or equivalently, Q1 plus Q2 is 1 over 1 plus RF. So going back up here to this main equation, when we multiply by Q1 plus Q2, that's the same as dividing by 1 plus RF, or multiplying by 1 over 1 plus RF. Okay? And then we've got these terms in brackets, Q1 over Q1 plus Q2, and Q2 over Q1 plus Q2. Now, what we're going to do is define uh, pseudo-probabilities, pi star 1 and pi star 2. And what, what are these things? They're just... Q1 divided by the sum of the Qs, and Q2 divided by the sum of the Qs. Now observe that these ratios here are positive, and they add up to 1, just like probabilities. So because state prices are positive, um, pi star 1 and pi star 2 are positive, and because we divided by Q1 plus Q2, when we add up the pi stars, we get 1. So these Pi stars have all the proper properties of probabilities. Um, they're not the objective, literal probabilities of the states, but they're numbers that can be treated as if they were probabilities. Uh, now, proceeding along those lines, we can also define a pseudo-expectation, E star, as a pseudo-probability weighted average of whatever's inside the brackets. Okay, well, then we can rewrite equation 2, the pricing equation, as uh, 1 over 1 plus RF times pi star 1 x1i plus pi star 2 x2i using these pseudo probabilities. And that's equivalent to 1 over 1 plus RF times E star of xi, the, the pseudo expectation using these pseudo probabilities uh, of the payoff. So what this means is that once we have the pseudo probabilities, we can price assets as if investors are risk neutral. We're just discounting at the riskless rate whatever the pseudo-expected payoff is. Now, just as a concept check, when are pseudo-probabilities equal to actual probabilities, that will require that investors are, are literally risk-neutral. But if they're risk-averse, then the pseudo-probabilities will not be the same. Okay, 
So um, uh, the the basic idea here is that if investors are literally risk neutral, then, then asset pricing is easy because the price of any asset is just its expected payoff discounted at the riskless rate. But we can adapt that approach even in a risk averse world to find pseudo probabilities, scaled state prices, so that the price of any asset is its pseudo expected payoff discounted at the riskless interest rate. These pseudo probabilities are also sometimes referred to as risk neutral probabilities and they're very convenient in the field of asset pricing because they enable us to proceed as if investors are risk neutral once we do this one trick of replacing actual probabilities with pseudo probabilities. Now we can apply this to option pricing by substituting uh, the pseudo probabilities for the true probabilities and proceeding as if investors were risk neutral. Okay, and the key insight is that the option prices we find in, in the, the, the as-if world, the hypothetical world where probabilities are pseudo-probabilities and investors are risk neutral, those option prices are also going to be correct in the actual world. And, um, you know, the, 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 the reason why probabilities um, don't come in is that they don't affect the option price once we control for prices the underlying security price and the riskless interest rate uh, using a no arbitrage argument. So this uh, alternative way of proceeding by, by thinking about an as-if world uh, is, is, is often easier to do the actual calculation. So in fact we're going to apply this to the two-state example in the binomial model. We'll do that in class and we'll see that uh, if we can find the pseudo probability um, by looking at the behavior of the stock, then we're going to be able to immediately get the uh, value of the call using that approach. Okay, now we're going to go on from the binomial model. We're going to go on and take another step and look at the Black-Scholes option pricing formula. So recall the binomial tree approach to option pricing. We were, we were working with a two-state example at the beginning of this tree here, where a stock can go up or down. Um, but we're going to now consider a, a, a much bigger binomial tree which keeps moving like this. Each step up is multiplying by some factor u. So if we have two up steps, that's u squared s0. Three up steps would be u cubed s0 and so on. Similarly for down steps. And then uh, if we multiply the up and the down, we get ud. And it doesn't matter whether you have u first and then d or d first and then u. You reach the same place. Uh, so this is a particular kind of binomial tree in which at each node the stock price either increases or decreases by a constant multiple. Uh, it's called a recombining uh, binomial tree because uh, of the way in which the, the branches come back together. And so the number of nodes, instead of increasing uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the square of the... Um, uh, instead of increasing in, in powers of 2 with the number of steps, it just increases linearly with the number of steps. Now this kind of binomial tree here has the property that, that as the time interval shrinks, the implied uh, price distribution approaches the log normal distribution, and that's a very uh, convenient property. So the Black-Scholes option pricing model is the limit of this binomial tree as the time interval shrinks, and when we consider the limit, we're making the following assumptions. There's continuous trading in the asset with no jumps in the underlying security price. So it's pri the price moves continuously. It has constant volatility, which we call sigma. By volatility, I mean standard deviation. There's a constant riskless interest rate, R. And we'll assume that there's no dividends on the underlying security. And we're talking about a European call option with exercise price X and maturity T. Well, what's the formula? Uh, now, here I'm on this slide, I'm writing the formula. It's going to look uh, very intimidating, uh, but take a deep breath and we'll, we'll talk through it. So, Black Scholes formula says that the price of a call is the price of the stock times this term n of d1 minus the discounted exercise price times this other term n of d2. Now, what does n of d1 and n of d2 mean? Well, D1 and D2 are defined down here, but let me go to the next slide and show you that N of D, for any D, is the probability that a standard normal random variable is less than D. In other words, it's the shaded blue area under the curve 
where d is indicated here. So whether it's d1, d2, whatever value you have, you calculate the probability that a standard normal random variable is less than that. You can, of course, do this on a computer, financial calculator, or by looking up a table of the standard normal distribution. OK, so that's what n of something means. And if we go back here, we've got n of d1 and n of d2. d1 is this ratio. We take the log of the ratio of the stock price to the exercise price, and then we have an adjustment for the interest rate for variance and time, and we divide by standard deviation times the square root of time. And d2 is the same as d1 with a further adjustment. We subtract sigma times the square root of time. All right, so that's the formula, but why is it this? Let's try to get more insight. So uh, let me just tell you some properties of the formula. Um, the call value depends on several observable things. The stock price appears, the interest rate appears, the time to expiration appears, and the strike price appears. Um, in addition, the call value will depend on something that's not directly observable, which is volatility. So let's go back and see that. We've got the stock price, the exercise price, the interest rate, the time to maturity, and then we've got uh, volatility sigma. Those are the things that go into the formula. If you know those, you know the option price. Now, the call value does not depend on the expected rate of return of the stock. And that's an extremely important point. It's one we've discussed in the last lecture, and I'll say more about it in a minute. Finally, let me note that n of d2 can be interpreted as the pseudo probability that the option expires in the money. OK, so I'll say more about that in a minute. So this is a picture of the, uh, the value of a call option. This is the um, a figure from Bodie, Kane, and Marcus that we've already seen. And you may remember that the dark gray line is the uh, intrinsic value. The light gray line is uh, shifted up, but it's s minus the present value of x as opposed to s minus x. And we know that the option value is always above the dark gray line. It is, in fact, something like the blue line. And the black shells formula gives you a shape like this that curves up. OK, now how can we derive this formula? Well, um, it's relatively easy to derive in the as-if world we were talking about, in which investors are risk neutral. And by the earlier trick that we discussed, this gives the correct price also for the actual world. So in the as-if world with risk-neutral investors, the option and the stock both have expected returns equal to the riskless interest rate R. And we can price the option by discounting its expected payoff at the riskless interest rate. So here's the math. And I'm not going to um, show you these derivations uh, more than these steps, but basically, uh, in the as-if world, the call price is the expected, this should be pseudo-expected, payoff on the option discounted at the riskless rate. So we multiply by e to the minus rt. What's the payoff on the option? It's the maximum of st minus x and 0. And again, we're discounting. And we can um, uh, um, expand that like this. We can say that the the expectation of this maximum is the expectation of st minus x conditional on st being bigger than x. In other words, conditional on having a positive number here. We take that expectation, then we multiply by the probability that st is bigger than x, and then we discount. The final step is to break this expectation into the two pieces. There's the expectation of s, and then the expectation of x, which of course is just x. All right. So the first piece, the expectation of st, given that st is bigger than x, times e to the minus rt times the probability st is bigger than x, that piece turns out to be s0 times n of d1. And then the, the, the expectation of minus x, which is just minus x, times e to the minus rt times the probability st is bigger than x, that down here is minus x e to the minus rt times this probability. That turns out to be x e to the minus rt times n of d2. All right, so it's minus x e to the minus rt n of d2. So n of d2 is the pseudo or risk neutral probability that st is bigger than x.
All right, so that's the interpretation of the formula. Um, now, let's think for a moment um, about the situation where the stock has a risk premium so that the actual world and the as-if world are different. Now, if the stock has a risk premium, that means the stock price is going to rise faster on average, so the expected payoff on the call option is higher because the expected future stock price is higher. However, the option shares the risk of the stock, so its discount rate is also higher. So we're going to take this higher future payoff and discount it at a higher rate. And in fact, the two things will cancel out. The extra discounting will exactly cancel the higher expected payoff, leaving the option price unaffected. So this is the economic intuition why the expected return on the stock doesn't affect the option price and why this analytical trick of doing risk neutral pricing uh, actually gives you the right answer. Uh, finally, let me just mention um, some, some extensions of the formula. Um, the formula is derived for a European call option on a security that pays uh, no dividends. Of course, an American call option on a security that pays no dividends has the same value. That's the no early exercise proposition. We can get the value of a European put by combining Black-Scholes formula with put call parity. However, the American put option value and the American call option value for a security that pays dividends do not have closed form solutions. One can get a computer to find a numerical solution, but there isn't an expression that one can write down, even one as complicated looking as the Black-Scholes formula. Thank you for listening. See you in class.